Thank you so much for inviting me here, and uh, thank you to the panel for presiding over these hearings. Uh, my name is Nusheen Sarkarati. I've been a senior staff attorney with the Center for Justice and Accountability um, for 12 years now, uh, where I've been litigating human rights cases primarily in U.S. courts and before international bodies. Um, I'm currently on leave from the Center for Justice and Accountability and working for Human Rights Watch's International Justice Program, but um, the information I'll be discussing today is based on my work at the Center for Justice and Accountability and the case that we filed on behalf of Ahimsa Wikramatunga. Could you provide a short outline of your activities, your work that you performed on behalf of the family of Mr. Wikramatunga? So my organization, CJA, has long been looking at Sri Lanka and options for justice uh, that may exist outside of the country. Um, we opened up investigations back in 2013, um, looking at possible cases that could be filed in the United States. Um, but it wasn't until 2016 that the family of Lasanta Wikramatunga reached out to us for assistance. Um, they wanted to understand better what their options were to pursue accountability through universal jurisdiction. At that time, a case was proceeding um, within Sri Lanka, a, a criminal investigation was proceeding within Sri Lanka, um, and we were monitoring the developments of that criminal investigation. Uh, we also started collecting open source information around Lasanta's death, um, and we started uh, collecting declassified government documents, um, UN reporting, human rights reporting, uh, and also the B reports that were issued by Nishanta De Silva in court uh, within Sri Lanka, which was the summaries of the investigations that he was giving uh, repeatedly to the judges uh, throughout the proceedings of his investigation. Uh, but because we believed that the case was moving forward in Sri Lanka, um, we just kept an eye and developed the investigation. But it wasn't until 2018 that it became clear that Sri Lanka was no, not really a viable jurisdiction for accountability. Uh, and that's when we started to take seriously putting together a universal jurisdiction case on behalf of Lasanta's family. Uh, and in 2019, we filed a case against Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who at that time was a civilian. He was the former Secretary of Defense. Uh, he was traveling to the United States, uh, and we served him personally when he was in California with the lawsuit. Can you describe what other steps you took um, outside of Sri Lanka and outside of the US? So we were exploring what options were available for Ahimsa's family and you know, although the international community had invested a lot of investigative effort on Sri Lanka, there were few options available outside of the country. Um, you know, there were individual communications that victims could make before certain treaty bodies like the Convention Against Torture or the ICCPR, but Sri Lanka hadn't ratified the Rome Statute. It wasn't within the jurisdiction of the ICC and there had long been effort um, seeking a Security Council referral before the ICC, but that uh, wasn't developing. Uh, there were other organizations, too, that were looking at universal jurisdiction cases in Europe. Um, but we focused on the U.S. because Gotabaya Rajapaksa was actually a U.S. citizen at the time he was committing these abuses. Uh, we were alerting the Department of Justice, which has a specialized war crimes unit known as the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Unit, um, that Gotabaya was traveling back and forth to the U.S. Uh, we were directing their attention to various uh, reporting, identifying his alleged war crimes, um, and pointing out the fact that the U.S. had jurisdiction and the laws to be able to prosecute him. But it wasn't until we went through all these efforts before we decided to take a civil, the civil suit forward. Can you describe for the tribunal the obstacles that you faced in the course of your civil litigation in the U.S.? Well, it's very difficult for a victim uh, to be able to find attorneys, investigate these claims on their own, even with an NGO like ours. Um, we are a non-governmental organization. We don't have the same resources that government entities do. 
So even tracking perpetrators, um, we have to rely on things like social media and open source to be able to identify locations. Um, luckily, Gotabaya Rajapaksa was a heavy Twitter user, so we were able to follow him somewhat uh, and identify his location that way. Um, but because this is a civil suit, we're also dealing with the fact that um, we can't provide witness protections, um, so it's difficult to find victims and witnesses that are willing to pro provide evidence um, to us uh, because we don't have those government resources to be able to relocate witnesses to testify. All of these are major obstacles to victims being able to litigate these cases themselves. Um, yet our clients are tenacious and victims and witnesses do come forward uh, to bring this evidence. Uh, and luckily we had a really strong, we had breakthroughs in the investigation within Sri Lanka that we were able to rely on in building our case in the US. Um, but once we filed the case, um, we brought on a law firm, Double Voice and Plimpton. You heard from my co-counsel yesterday, Catherine Amirfar, to assist us in litigating the complex claims that we had filed. Our case was um, alleging torture and extrajudicial killing of Lasanta Wickramatunga, but we were also trying to prove that Lasanta's murder wasn't unique. It was part of a systematic and widespread attack against journalists um, that was committed to you know, during the period in which the Rajapaksas were in power. Um, you know, we found that Lasanta's attack followed a pattern of attacks that were occurring against other journalists at that time, which was essentially journalists that dared report on corruption or human rights abuses against the government, um, would be labeled as terrorists or would be labeled as um, Tamil Tiger sympathizers. Their names would be put on a Ministry of Defense website. Um, they would start uh, receiving harassing letters, um, they'd be intimidated, several journalists would be picked up in white vans, abducted, abused, and some individuals like Lasanta would be killed. Um, so proving these types of claims, like a crime against humanity claim, was going to be a significant battle. Um, and we, were, we brought on this law firm to assist us. And Gotabaya Rajapaksa hired a very famous law firm to defend himself and brought on a massive team. Um, this, the law firm was Aiken Gump. Uh, and they immediately filed a motion to dismiss, raising several defenses to try to get the case dismissed out of court before we even came close to a trial. Um, these defenses, there were numerous defenses, but the main ones were arguing that Sri Lanka was a more viable jurisdiction, that we had to exhaust remedies in Sri Lanka, um, and then also that uh, Gotapai Rajapaksa, because of his official position at the time the attacks were occurring, um, he had official acts immunity, what we refer to as common law immunity. We were litigating these, um, these initial defenses, uh, and then the Easter Sunday attacks occurred in Sri Lanka. Uh, following that, Gotabaya Rajapaksa um, announced that he would be running for president. He tried to get the case uh, delayed until after the election, saying that it was interfering with his ability to run for president, um, but the judge did not grant that delay. Um, however, he was elected uh, president later that year, and because of that, and because we were in a national court, he was given absolute immunity as a head of state. So we weren't allowed to proceed with our civil suit. It was dismissed without prejudice, which means that it can be filed again once his immunity is lifted. Um, but that's the limitations we have uh, working in national court systems. This isn't a limitation that would exist um, before an international court or an international criminal court. Yeah. What is the current status of the pending litigation? So because Rajapaksa is still president, um, you know, and the case was dismissed, he still has head of state immunity. We wouldn't be able to refile the case until that head of state immunity is lifted. And we also would need jurisdiction over Rajapaksa to proceed. Um, and I understand that you have a pending UN communication as well. Um, can you walk us through the objectives? What, what are you trying to achieve or hoping to achieve through the UN communication? 
Yeah, after our case was dismissed, uh, we had collected, you know, years worth of evidence. A lot of investigation had gone into this case. Um, we didn't want it to be for naught. Uh, so we decided to assist Ahimsa in filing an individual communication before the Human Rights Committee, alleging that La Santa had several of his rights violated under the International Convention for Civil and Political Rights, uh, namely his right to life, his right to be free from torture, um, his right for free expression, and also Ahimsa's right to a, a remedy. And we detailed in the complaint not only the things that we had alleged in our civil suit, arguing that Gotabaya Rajapaksa was a commander in charge of the uh, military intelligence unit that was responsible for the death of her father. Um, we also brought up all the interference that we witnessed um, from the government side that prevented the case from moving forward within Sri Lanka. This was heavily detailed as part of our argument that Sri Lanka wasn't offering victims a right to a remedy. Um, and this interference was touched upon by Nishanta De Silva, um, but some of this included things like evidence being confiscated, um, a notebook in which Lasanta had been um, writing down the license plate numbers of motorcyclists had been destroyed, um, and also when you know investigators such as Nishanta would seek to interrogate certain individuals within the Tripoli platoon. Those individuals would be transferred out of the country, so they were out of reach of criminal investigators. Um, it became clear that an investigation couldn't move forward while the Rajapaksas were in power. And even after they were removed from power, the Sirisena government also did not um, really provide a viable option for accountability for victims either. And that's heavily detailed in our complaint. We also do lay out some of the attacks that occurred. <laughs> we also laid out some of the attacks that occurred against other journalists, showing the pattern of violence that was happening against other journalists at the time. And because the Rajapaksas are now back in power, uh, we also identified some of the resurgence of violence against journalists, some of the chilling effects that were happening, the self-censorship um, that had occurred under the previous administration were now uh, returning. Could you share with us your perspective on the current situation uh, with the protests in Sri Lanka? and how this may lead to some new avenues opening up for accountability or reform of some nature. Well, of course, the protests in Sri Lanka um, are mostly linked to the economic crisis that's occurring, but also for a failure of faith in government. And I think that failure of faith in government really happens when you have pervasive impunity for crimes such as this, when you have the murder of a beloved journalist, um, where there's been an international outcry calling for justice, tenacity of the families calling for justice for over a decade, and the government um, does not provide that kind of accountability. People lose faith in the ability of the government to actually govern and protect its own people. Um, so I think that does contribute to the type of uh, destruction that we see, the loss of faith in the country that we're seeing now. Um, but this impunity is a bigger problem um, that occurs outside of Sri Lanka. There were many countries that could have acted and failed to act to hold perpetrators accountable. Um, you know, the Rajapaksas were traveling extensively throughout Europe and the U.S., and the U.S. even had the criminal jurisdiction, the power to hold uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa accountable. He was a U.S. citizen at the time he was committing these alleged war crimes and abuses. Um, so it was a crisis that other countries also contributed to by failing to act um, when they had the chance and the opportunity and um, you know, especially because the High Commissioner was calling upon countries to act and use their national jurisdictions to hold these individuals accountable um, and yet we continued to fail in that regard. Um, but in regards to hope, I do think that there is, um, you know, there have been some developments that are providing a newer perspective of hope um, for accountability in the future. And that namely comes from the Human Rights Council resolution, Resolution 46, which 
increase the mandate of the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights to um, increase its reporting and monitoring on human rights abuses in Sri Lanka, but also to uh, create a special unit that can collect and preserve uh, evidence of human rights abuses for the purpose of future litigation. Um, what we were seeing at the time that the Rajapaksas were in power is that witnesses were too afraid to come forward um, and share evidence. Also, these perpetrators had diplomatic immunity or, or they have head of state immunity that prevents cases from moving forward. Um, and when they're in power, they can destroy evidence that's within the country. So it's necessary that as we're doing our human rights fact finding, this evidence gets preserved, collated, analyzed um, for future jurisdictions that are able to bring cases. And now OHCHR is actively doing that uh, and collecting and preserving this evidence um, with the hope that they will be able to share it with national courts or um, international courts in the future that can develop of cases. If you'll allow me, because of your extensive experience in lobbying for accountability worldwide in relation to the crimes that happened in Sri Lanka, um, I was wondering what is your perspective with regards to the reasons why the other states that could have acted failed to act? You know, this would just be a guess on my part as I am not a government actor. Um, but I think that for some states, they may have thought that because the US, because Gotabaya Rajapaksa was a US citizen, that the US was the uh, most likely the right venue for to bring a criminal case uh, against the Rajapaksa family. Also, other members of the Rajapaksa family were frequently traveling to the United States. I also think that it's very difficult to investigate these these types of crimes, um, as I've discovered on my own. It's very difficult to get witnesses to come forward um, and feel safe to share evidence, uh, especially when you're doing these investigations remotely. Um, so I imagine it was quite difficult for the Department of Justice in the US, which may not have had strong connections with victims on the ground in Sri Lanka, to be able to um, develop its investigation. But despite that, there also needs to be political will, um, and the US has often shown that it lacks a political will to bring human rights cases. Its focus usually is on immigration fraud, deportation of human rights abusers, and bringing terrorism cases. And this is a similar thing that we see in other countries as well, um, that their focus really is on just bringing terrorism type charges, not really human rights cases. Um, so, so that's also been another problem of why we think that there haven't been more indictments. And I have one last question. Um, in your experience, how, what is the connection and, and possibly the evolution, if at all, um, of the situation in Sri Lanka, starting from this repression, the repression of freedom of expression to this, this connection of this, this growing distrust um, towards the government to bring the situation to where we are now, where um, we've seen that the houses of members of parliaments are in flames and, and the country is breaking down. I mean, I think this is something that was touched upon yesterday by my colleagues that, um, you know, one of the ways in which the government tries to hold on to power and destroy democracy is by um, targeting journalists, destroying journalists, um, limiting free speech. Uh, so clearly the fact that the administrations have long been targeting journalists and attacking journalists shows that for several decades now their democracy has been unfolding. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. I uh, hand over the floor to the judges. Thanks very much. That was really interesting. A lot of a lot of information. Um, <clears throat> do we have any uh, questions from judges at this point? Uh, what about remotely? I can't see on the screen uh, our remote judges. Is it possible to show that on the screen? Oh, did you have any questions? No, I, I'm going to read the document. <laughs> <laughs> Marina? Well, me too. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, do we have cases 
uh, were a similar attempt to file, I mean, to reach justice through a universal jurisdiction uh, succeeded? For Sri Lanka, unfortunately, no, but there are many universal jurisdiction cases that are proceeding um, with successful convictions in other contexts. Um, there was a recent victory against a member of the Assad regime in Germany under universal jurisdiction. Um, so this area of law is quite robust and has been um, moving forward uh, in certain countries, but these are often countries in which um, our governments agree that they, they would like to put their energy and focus on an investigation. Sri Lanka did have that energy and focus uh, 10 years ago, um, but right now to get governments to reopen these investigations, put, that, put Sri Lanka back into focus is quite difficult um, because there are so many other active situations like in Myanmar um, and still in Syria and Ukraine where many governments wanna focus their investigative energy. But that's unfortunate because it's often, um, you know, at times like this when things have settled somewhat that you can really bring cases and see that justice is possible. Uh, thank you. And I want to know, uh, you talk about the open sources that you look collect or try to collect evidences. If you can talk more about what uh, evidences or how you make strong the case. Thank you. Yeah, we, we actually uh, attach a lot of open source materials in our UN communication. It's not in our civil complaint because um, usually in a US case, you don't cite to your evidence in the civil initial complaint. Um, but our UN communication, we have an annex um, that includes all the open source information. Um, but we did do an investigation where we interviewed victims and witnesses as well, and um, they were quite terrified to be able to speak publicly. Um, so many of them told us that if Gotabaya Rajapaksa became president, they would not be able to participate in our case um, if it were to proceed. But we knew at that time that if he became president, um, we would lose the case um, due to head of state immunity regardless. Um, but if there's a transition in government in the future, you may see victims and witnesses willing to proceed. But the open source evidence actually comes a lot from communications from the um, Ministry of Defense itself and Gotapaya Rajapaksa himself. He was um, quite verbal in the media. And those kinds of statements, those are admissions that we can include as evidence. So we collected a lot of reporting um, of interviews that he'd done where he explained the restructuring of the military, how he created a central command of the intelligence that reported directly to him. All of this goes towards command responsibility. Um, so we relied heavily on information like that. Um, we also collected human rights reports, uh, like the extensive reporting done by the Committee to Protect Journalists on the targeting of journalists, which really helped us identify the pattern of abuses against journalists at that time. Um, also, the UN had done extensive reporting on Sri Lanka. Uh, they had a UN panel of experts. Um, they had the High Commissioner's Report, um, Commission of Inquiry that we relied on as well. Uh, the US government also had some documents that were collected that we were able to uh, seek through um, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so so all of this, um, all of this type of open source information that we collect as part of our investigation is, is the norm. Um, we also look at social media accounts like Facebook, uh, the Ministry of Defense had these types of accounts that we would collect information from. Um, but usually this information is meant to just corroborate what victims and witnesses say in court. So you still need the victims and witnesses to be able to come forward to really bring these cases. Uh, you said that the witness, um, many times they are really, really afraid, no? They are scared. Do you know if they have received threats outside, uh, just outside Sri Lanka? if they are in danger also even uh, living away. And the other thing you mentioned that you send this case also for torture, yes? 
and it's about La Santa or how would you how are you explaining or argumenting the torture? Um, in terms of the intimidation outside of Sri Lanka, um, we have heard that some individuals do continue to be intimidated outside of Sri Lanka. I don't have firsthand knowledge of that, um, but I do know that some of the individuals we worked with within Sri Lanka were forced to flee the country as soon as Gotabaya Rajapaksa came into power um, and lived in fear outside of the country and did not want us to disclose their location. Um, so I know that they continue to live in fear even in the diaspora. A lot of witnesses as well in the diaspora that spoke to us had a lot of fear for their family back home. Um, so even finding a witness that's safely outside the country, um, you know, it's very difficult to get them to come forward. We even found it difficult to find a Sri Lankan legal expert to um, work with us on the case who, would, who could just explain the constitutional limitations or, or some of the laws in Sri Lanka, like the Prevention of Terrorism Act that was being used to intimidate journalists at the time um, that was willing to testify in court and provide an expert report because they were so afraid to be linked to a case like this. Um, so that was the difficulty. Um, in terms of the torture allegation, our allegation was that the means in which um, La Santa was attacked, the, the brutality in which he was beaten prior to his death and punctured in the skull, um, that amounted to torture prior to his death, especially because he was confined. Um, he was surrounded by the command, the black clad commandos. Um, he didn't die immediately. It took several hours for him to die. He died in a hospital um, going through emergency surgery. Um, so, so we allege that um, he, he experienced torture prior to his death as well. Yes, I had uh, uh, two questions. Uh, <clears throat> could you say something a little more about the um, special evidence unit that you referred to? Um, uh, could you tell us a little more about where, how far that has got and, and, and what, what, what has been achieved so far? That's one question. And another question is about the um, question of, um, of people being uh, in exile still finding, um, uh, finding themselves under, um, under threat and also under um, repression from countries in which they are located, in particular the terrorism uh, allegations and allegations of, um, of um, LTTE connections uh, that are still going forward, I believe, in some jurisdictions. Um, so I think you're referring to the UN mandate for evidence collection. Uh, so that, uh, I believe that the Human Rights Council resolution was passed in 2021, but it took some time for the team to be formed, mostly because of funding issues. The UN still had to approve a budget um, to hire the proper staff to collect the mandate. Um, and I think that that was a, a bit of a difficulty and took quite a bit of lobbying to get the appropriate budget, but the team is up and running now. I believe there's eight members um, who, who are, have the duty to now preserve and collect this evidence. Um, I don't know what the priorities are for their investigation. I don't think that they have any type of restrictions in terms of temporal jurisdiction. I think they can, um, they can look at human rights abuses that happened in the past and also ongoing human rights abuses. Um, and we've seen these types of mechanisms already be effective in other contexts. Um, the uh, an independent mechanism was set up to collect and preserve evidence in Syria. It's already assisted universal jurisdiction cases that have moved forward in Germany. Um, there is another independent mechanism set up for Myanmar. I believe it's assisting a universal jurisdiction case in Argentina. Um, so there's a lot of hope that this Sri Lanka uh, mandate will be able to assist future accountability efforts. Um, in terms of intimidation in the diaspora with allegations of terrorism, I can't actually speak to that, unfortunately. It's not something I'm very familiar with. I want to know if you can talk about the impacts for the family, because yes, in this in this hearing, we have not people just close to the family. So, yeah, as somebody who works really quite closely with the family, um, 
you know, hearings such as this are actually really important to them because they want to make sure that the matter is live and not forgotten. You know, this assassination occurred in 2009. There was such a large international outcry calling for justice. There were a lot of advances domestically um, led by Nishanta De Silva's team. So there was a lot of hope um, by the family that they would actually see prosecutions. You know, perpetrators were identified and named um, as part of the proceedings. So they really thought they'd see indictments. Um, unfortunately, when the election happened and, uh, and Gotabaya Rajapaksa became president, there was extreme depression over that. Um, it was very difficult to speak to the family about uh, the immunity issues uh, that dismissed our case. And it's why we pivoted with the complaint before the UN to keep hope alive, which was very important to them. Um, it's also why we uh, been assisting your tribunal because we we want to make sure that the matter is still alive um, and that the evidence that we've collected isn't completely siloed um, just by our NGO um, that it can be shared with others who who can do something with it you know if the UN can um, issue recommendations to Sri Lanka based on the evidence we collected we want to support that um, so the family still holds on to hope um, but I can't imagine how difficult it is to see perpetrators back in power, um, even individual members of the Tripoli platoon that have been linked to three journalist attacks. Um, they were, once Gotabaya Rajapaksa became president, they were immediately put back into high level positions um, in military intelligence. Some of them have been sanctioned by the US because of their human rights abuse, which is um, you know, some relief that they can't travel to the US, they can't do business in the US, but um, that's only a minor relief uh, when they're back in power in Sri Lanka, given that high level position of power, um, able to, when they're able to surveil citizens despite the allegations against them that they abused that surveillance in the past, it's quite frightening. Uh, and then also the uh, commission, the presidential commission that was set up to exonerate these individuals and drop any charges against them, things like that are very difficult for the victims to witness. Um, so that's why we have to go to the international community with this information. Um, but Sri Lankans clearly haven't forgotten these abuses. Uh, you know, journalists like Dil Rikshi earlier was saying how important it is to still see justice here. So, so the information isn't forgotten yet. No more from Marina or Gil at this stage? No, thank you. I, w I was wondering if we might have potentially a situation in which uh, once uh, President Rajapaksha is not president anymore and is a civilian, uh, is still a US citizen, uh, could we have a potential situation in which he travel abroad and he is arrested because there is a case pending on him? He's no longer a U.S. citizen. He uh, renounced his citizenship mm -hmm. um, in order to run for pre the, in the presidential election. Um, but of course, if he travels abroad, uh, you know, universal jurisdiction still applies in many countries. It just requires presence of a perpetrator. Um, it, you know, each country has different laws, but often presence is enough to trigger jurisdiction. And in fact, um, universal jurisdiction is defined as providing the ability to hold these type, use your court system um, for crimes committed outside of the country, even if the victim is not a national of that country or, or the perpetrator isn't a national of that country. Um, so it's meant to be able to use your court system um, whenever these perpetrators uh, may travel through that country. Um, so it doesn't matter if he's a US citizen or not. Whether or not he travels to one of these countries, I'm sure he's I'm sure he's quite savvy um, at this point. Um, so it might take it might take mutual legal assistance from countries that want to hold him to account. It might take extraditions in the future, um, and it definitely will take international calls for action. Just to clarify, is there a case pending against him? Because you, you said yours in the U.S. was dismissed. Yeah, our case was dismissed. Yeah. So there's not a there pending case at the moment. So there would need to be one refiled in the future. I think that's all from us. Yeah. Uh, back to the prosecutor. 